Figure 3-31. Probes within a bell methane lid used to measure intake temperature and pressure. Figure 3-32. An example of a ducted arrangement on a turboprop engine. Thrust stand is made up of two components, one non-moving and one moving. This is so the moving component can push against a load cell and measure thrust during the testing of the engine. The bell myth is designed with the single objective of obtaining very high aerodynamic efficiency. Essentially, the inlet is a bell-shaped funnel having carefully rounded shoulders which offer practically no air resistance. Figure 3-30. Duct loss is so slight that it is considered zero. The engine can, therefore, be operated without the complications resulting from losses common to an installed aircraft inlet duct. Engine performance data, such as rated thrust and thrust-specific fuel consumption, are obtained while using a bell myth inlet. Usually, the inlets are fitted with protective screening. In this case, the efficiency lost as the air passes through the screen must be taken into account, when very accurate engine data are necessary. Turboprop and Turboshaft Compressor Inlets The air inlet on a turboprop is more of a problem than some other gas turbine engines, because the propeller drive shaft, the hub, and the spinner must be considered in addition to other inlet design factors. The ducted arrangement is generally considered the best inlet design of the turboprop engine as far as airflow and aerodynamic characteristics are concerned. Figure 3-32 the inlet for many types of turboprops are empty iced by using electrical elements in the lip opening of the intake. Ducting either part of the engine or notch directs the airflow to the intake of the engine. Deflector doors are sometimes used to deflect ice or dirt away from the intake. Figure 3-33. The air then passes through a screen and into the engine on some models. A conical spinner, which does not allow ice to build up on the surface, is sometimes used with turboprop and turbofan engines. In either event, the arrangement of the spinner and the inlet duct plays an important function in the operation and performance of the engine. Figure 3-33. Deflector doors used to deflect ice or dirt away from the intake. Turbofan engine inlet sections. High bypass turbofan engines are usually constructed with a fan at the forward end of the compressor. A typical turbofan intake section is shown in figure 3-34. Sometimes, the inlet cowl is bolted to the front of the engine and provides the airflow path into the engine. In dual compressor, dual spool, engines, the fan is integral with the relatively slow-turning, low-pressure compressor, which allows the fan blades to rotate at low tip speed for best fan efficiency. The fan permits the use of a conventional air inlet duct, resulting in low inlet duct loss. The fan reduces engine damage from ingested foreign material, because much of any material that may be ingested is thrown radially outward and passes through the fan discharge rather than through the core of the engine. Warm bleed air is drawn from the engine and circulated on the inside of the inlet lip for anti-icing. The fan hub or spinner is either heated by warm air or is conical. 3-21 Figure 3-34 A typical turbofan intake section. Figure 3-36 the air that passes through the inner part of the fan blades becomes the primary airstream. As mentioned earlier, inside the inlet by the fan blade tips is an abradable rub strip that allows the fan blades to rub for short times due to flight path changes. Figure 3-35, also, inside the inlet are sound producing materials to lower the noise generated by the fan. Figure 3-35, rubber stripping inside the turbofan engine inlet allows for friction for short periods of time during changes in the flight path. The fan on high bypass engines consists of one stage of rotating blades and stationary vanes that can range in diameter from less than 84 inches to more than 112 inches. Figure 3-36. The fan blades are either hollow titanium or composite materials. The air accelerated by the outer part of the fan blades forms a secondary airstream, which is ducted overboard without passing through the main engine. This secondary air, fan flow, produces 80% of the thrust in high bypass engines. The air that passes through the inner part of the fan blades becomes the primary airstream, core flow, through the engine itself. Figure 3-36. The air from the fan exhaust, which is ducted overboard, may be discharged in either of two ways. 1. To the outside air through short ducts, dual exhaust nozzles, directly behind the fan. Figure 3-37. Fan discharge. Figure 3-37. Air from the fan exhaust can be discharged overboard through short ducts directly behind the fan. 2. Ducted fan, which uses closed ducts all the way to the rear of the engine, where it is exhausted to the outside air through a mixed exhaust nozzle. This type engine is called a ducted fan and the core airflow and fan airflow mix in a common exhaust nozzle. Reciprocating Engine Exhaust Systems The reciprocating engine exhaust system is fundamentally a scavenging system that collects and disposes of the high temperature, noxious gases being discharged by the engine. Its main function is to dispose of the gases with complete. 3-22 Safety to the airframe and the occupants of the aircraft The exhaust system can perform many useful functions, but its first duty is to provide protection against the potentially destructive action of the exhaust gases. Modern exhaust systems, though comparatively light, adequately resist high temperatures, corrosion, and vibration to provide long, trouble-free operation with minimum maintenance. There are two general types of exhaust systems in use on reciprocating aircraft engines, the short stack, open, system and the collector system. The short stack system is generally used on non-supercharged engines, and low-powered engines, where noise level is not too objectionable.
The collector system is used on most large non-supercharged engines, and on all turbo supercharged engines and installations on which it would improve notch L streamlining, or provide easier maintenance in the notch L area. On turbo supercharged engines, the exhaust gases must be collected to drive the turbine compressor of the supercharger. Such systems have individual exhaust headers that empty into a common collector ring with only one outlet. From this outlet, the hot exhaust gas is routed via a tailpipe to the turbo supercharger that drives the turbine. Although the collector system raises the back pressure of the exhaust system, the gain in horsepower from turbo supercharging more than offsets the loss in horsepower that results from increased back pressure. The short stack system is relatively simple, and its removal and installation consists essentially of removing and installing the hold down nuts and clamps. Short stack systems have limited use on most modern aircraft. In Figure 3-38, the location of typical collector exhaust system components of a horizontally opposed engine is shown in a side view. The exhaust system in this installation consists of a downstack from each cylinder an exhaust collector tube on each side of the engine, and an exhaust ejector assembly protruding aft and down from each side of the firewall. The down stacks are connected to the cylinders. Figure 3-38 Location of a typical collector exhaust system With high temperature lock nuts and secured to the exhaust collector tube by ring clamps. A cabin heater exhaust shroud is installed around each collector tube. Figure 3-39 Upper sheet jacket Heat exchanger collector tube Lower sheet jacket Figure 3-39 A cabin heater exhaust shroud the collector tubes terminate at the exhaust ejector openings at the firewall and are tapered to deliver the exhaust gases at the proper velocity to induce airflow through the exhaust ejectors. The exhaust ejectors consist of a throat and duct assembly that utilizes the pumping action of the exhaust gases to induce a flow of cooling air through all parts of the engine compartment. Augmenter tube action. Radial engine exhaust collector ring system. Figure 3-40 shows the exhaust collector ring installed on a 14-cylinder radial engine. The collector ring is a welded corrosion-resistant steel assembly manufactured in seven sections, with each section collecting the exhaust from two cylinders. The sections are graduated in size. Figure 3-41. The small sections are on the inboard side, and the largest sections are on the outboard side at the point, where the tailpipe connects to the collector ring. Each section of the collector ring is bolted to a bracket on the lower section of the engine, and is partly supported by a sleeve connection between the collector ring ports, and the short stack on the engine exhaust ports. The exhaust tailpipe is joined to the collector ring by a telescoping expansion joint, which allows enough slack for the removal of segments of the collector ring without removing the tailpipe. The exhaust tailpipe is a welded, Corrosion-resistant steel assembly consisting of the exhaust tailpipe. On some aircraft, a muff-type heat exchanger. 3-23. A BCDF. Clamp assembly telescoping flange main exhaust segment engine diaphragm clamp assembly clevis pin and washer. A. CBD. EF. Figure 3-40. Elements of an exhaust collector ring installed on a radial engine. Manifold and augmenter exhaust assembly. Some radial engines are equipped with a combination exhaust manifold and augmenter assembly. On a typical 18-cylinder engine. Two exhaust assemblies, and two augmenter assemblies are used. Each manifold assembly collects exhaust gases from nine cylinders, and discharges the gases into the forward end of the augmenter assembly. The exhaust gases are directed into the augmenter belmuths. The augmenters are designed to produce a venturi effect, to draw an increased airflow over the engine to augment engine cooling. An augmenter vane is located in each tailpipe. When the vane is fully closed, the cross-sectional area of the tailpipe is reduced by approximately 45%. The augmenter vanes are operated by an electrical actuator and indicators adjacent to the augmenter vane switches in the cockpit show vane positions. The vanes may be moved toward the closed position to decrease the velocity of flow through the augmenter to raise the engine temperature. This system is only used with older aircraft that generally use radial engines. Reciprocating engine exhaust system maintenance practices. Any exhaust system failure should be regarded as a severe hazard. Depending on the location and type of failure, an exhaust system failure can result in carbon monoxide poisoning of crew and passengers, partial or complete loss of engine power, or an aircraft fire. Cracks in components, leaking gaskets, or complete failure can cause serious problems in flight. Often, these failures can be detected before complete failure. Black soot around an exhaust gasket shows the gasket has failed. The exhaust system should be inspected very thoroughly. Figure 3-41 A radial engine exhaust collector ring is graduated in size from the inboard side to the outboard side. Exhaust system inspection While the type and location of exhaust system components vary somewhat with the type of aircraft, the inspection requirements for most reciprocating engine exhaust systems are very similar. The following paragraphs include a discussion of the most common exhaust system inspection items and procedures for all reciprocating engines. Figure 3-42 shows the primary inspection areas of three types of exhaust systems. When performing maintenance on exhaust systems, never use galvanized or zinc-plated tools on the exhaust system. Exhaust system parts should never be marked with a lead pencil. The lead, zinc, or galvanized mark is absorbed by the metal of the exhaust system when heated, creating a distinct change in its molecular structure. This change softens the metal in the area of the mark causing cracks and eventual failure. After the installation of a complete exhaust system and all pieces of engine cowl are installed and secured, 
The engine should be operated to allow the exhaust system to heat up to normal operating temperatures. The engine is then shut down and the cowling removed to expose the exhaust system. Each clamp connection and each exhaust port connection should be inspected for evidence of exhaust gas leakage. 3-24 A B C Figure 3-42 Primary inspection areas of three types of exhaust systems. An exhaust leak is indicated by a flat gray or a sooty black streak on the pipes in the area of the leak. An exhaust leak is usually the result of poor alignment of two mated exhaust system members. When a leaking exhaust connection is discovered, the clamps should be loosened and the leaking units repositioned to ensure a gas tight fit. After repositioning, the system nut should be retightened enough to eliminate any looseness without exceeding the specified torque. If tightening to a specified torque does not eliminate the looseness, the bolts and nuts should be replaced since they have probably stretched. After tightening to a specified torque, all nuts should be safeted. With the cowling removed, all necessary cleaning operations can be performed. Some exhaust units are manufactured with a plain sandblast finish. Others may have a ceramic coated finish. Drummy coated stacks should be cleaned by degreasing only. They should never be cleaned with sandblast or alkali cleaners. During the inspection of an exhaust system, close attention should be given to all external surfaces of the exhaust system for cracks, dents, or missing parts. This also applies to welds, clamps, supports, support attachment lugs, bracing, slip joints, stack flanges, gaskets, and flexible couplings. Each bend should be examined, as well as areas adjacent to welds. Any dented areas or low spots in the system should be inspected for thinning and pitting due to internal erosion by combustion products or accumulated moisture. An ice pick or similar pointed instrument is useful in probing suspected areas. The system should be disassembled as necessary to inspect internal baffles or diffusers. If a component of the exhaust system is inaccessible for a thorough visual inspection, or is hidden by non-removable parts, it should be removed and checked for possible leaks. This can often be accomplished best by plugging the openings of the component, applying a suitable internal pressure, approximately 2 psi, and submerging it in water. Any leaks cause bubbles that can readily be detected. The procedures required for an installation inspection are also performed during most regular inspections. Daily inspection of the exhaust system usually consists of checking the exposed exhaust system for cracks, scaling, excessive leakage, and loose clamps, muffler and heat exchanger failures. Approximately half of all muffler and heat exchanger failures can be traced to cracks or ruptures in the heat exchanger surfaces used for cabin and carburetor heat sources. Failures in the heat exchanger surface, usually in the outer wall, allow exhaust gases to escape directly into the cabin heat system. These failures, in most cases, are caused by thermal and vibration fatigue cracking in areas of stress concentration. Failure of the spot welds, which attach the heat transfer pins, can result in exhaust gas leakage. In addition to a carbon monoxide hazard, failure of heat exchanger surfaces can permit exhaust gases to be drawn into the engine induction system, causing engine overheating and power loss. Exhaust manifold and stack failures. Exhaust manifold and stack failures are usually fatigue failures at welded or clamped points. For example, stack to flange, stack to manifold and crossover pipe or muffler connections. Although these failures are primarily fire hazards, they also present carbon monoxide problems. Exhaust gases can enter the cabin via defective or inadequate seals at firewall openings, wing strut fittings, doors, and wing root openings. Internal muffler failures, internal failures, baffles, diffusers, etc., can cause partial or complete engine power loss by restricting the flow of the exhaust gases. If pieces of the internal baffling breaks loose. 3-25 and partially or totally blocks the flow of exhaust gases, engine failure can occur. Figure 3-43, as opposed to other failures, erosion and carburization caused by the extreme thermal conditions are the primary causes of internal failures. Engine backfiring and combustion of unburned fuel within the exhaust system are probable contributing factors. In addition, local hot spot areas caused by uneven exhaust gas flow can result in burning, bulging, or rupture of the outer muffler wall. Figure 3-43, an example of internal muffler failure. Muffler failure can be caused by erosion and carbonization which in turn can lead to breakage blocking exhaust flow. Exhaust systems with turbocharger. When a turbocharger or a turbo supercharger system is included, the engine exhaust system operates under greatly increased pressure and temperature conditions. Extra precautions should be taken in exhaust system care and maintenance. During high pressure altitude operation, the exhaust system pressure is maintained at or near sea level values. Due to the pressure differential, any leaks in the system allow the exhaust gases to escape with torque-like intensity that can severely damage adjacent structures. A common cause of malfunction is coke deposits, carbon buildup, in the waste ticket unit causing erratic system operation. Excessive deposit buildups may cause the waste ticket valve to stick in the closed position, causing an overboost condition. Coke deposit buildup in the turbo itself causes a gradual loss of power in flight and low manifold pressure reading prior to takeoff. Experience has shown that periodic decoking, or removal of carbon deposits, is necessary to maintain peak efficiency. Clean. Repair. Overhaul and adjust the system components and controls in accordance with the applicable manufacturer's instructions. Augmenter Exhaust System 
on exhaust systems equipped with augmenter tubes. The augmenter tubes should be inspected at regular intervals for proper alignment, security of attachment, and general overall condition. Even where augmenter tubes do not contain heat exchanger surfaces, they should be inspected for cracks along with the remainder of the exhaust system. Cracks in augmenter tubes can present a fire or carbon monoxide hazard by allowing exhaust gases to enter the notch L, wing, or cabin areas. Exhaust system repairs. It is generally recommended that exhaust stacks, mufflers, tailpipes, etc., be replaced with new or reconditioned components rather than repaired. Welded repairs to exhaust systems are complicated by the difficulty of accurately identifying the base metal, so that the proper repair materials can be selected. Changes in composition and grain structure of the original base metal further complicate the repair. However, when welded repairs are necessary, the original contours should be retained. The exhaust system alignment must not be warped or otherwise affected. Repairs or sloppy weld beads that protrude internally are not acceptable as they cause local hot spots and may restrict exhaust gas flow. The proper hardware and clamps should always be used when repairing or replacing exhaust system components. Steel or low temperature. Self-locking nuts should not be substituted for brass or special high temperature lock nuts used by the manufacturer. Old gaskets should never be reused. When disassembly is necessary, gaskets should be replaced with new ones of the same type provided by the manufacturer. Turbine engine exhaust nozzles. Turbine engines have several different types of exhaust nozzles depending upon the type of engine. Turbo shaft engines in helicopters can have an exhaust nozzle that forms a divergent duct. This type of nozzle would not provide any thrust, all engine power going to rotate the rotors. Improving helicopter hovering abilities. Turbofan engines tend to fall into either ducted fan or unducted fan engines. Ducted fan engines take the fan airflow and direct it through closed ducts along the engine. Then, it flows into a common exhaust nozzle. The core exhaust flow and the fan flow mix and flow from the engine through this mixed nozzle. The unducted fan has two nozzles, one for the fan airflow and one for the core airflow. These both flow to ambient air separate from each other, and have separate nozzles. Figure 3-44. The unducted engine, or the separate nozzle engine handles high amounts of airflow. The fan air which creates most of the thrust, 80-85% total thrust, must be directed through. 3-26. Fan airflow. Core airflow. Core airflow. Fan airflow. Figure 3-44. Path of both core exhaust flow and fan flow from the engine to separate nozzles. The fan blades and exit vanes with little turbulence as possible. Figure 3-45, the core airflow needs to be straightened as it comes from the turbine. Through the use of a converging nozzle, the exhaust gases increase in velocity before they are discharged from the exhaust nozzle. Increasing the velocity of the gases increases their momentum, and increases the thrust produced, 20-15% total thrust. Most of the energy of the gases have been absorbed to drive the fan through the low-pressure turbine stages. Figure 3-45. Fan air is directed through the fan blades and exit vanes. Turboprop exhaust nozzles provide small amounts of thrust, 10-15%, but are mainly used to discharge the exhaust gases from the aircraft. Most of the energy has been transferred to the propeller. On some turboprop aircraft, an exhaust duct is often referred to as a tailpipe, although the duct itself is essentially a simple stainless steel, conical or cylindrical pipe. The assembly also includes an engine tail cone and the struts inside the duct. The tail cone and the struts add strength to the duct impart an axial direction to the gas flow, and smooth the gas flow. In a typical installation, the tailpipe assembly is mounted in the notch L and attached at its forward end to the firewall. The forward section of the tailpipe is funnel-shaped and surrounds, but does not contact the turbine exhaust section. This arrangement forms an annular gap that serves as an air ejector for the air surrounding the engine hot section. As the high-velocity exhaust gases enter the tailpipe, a low-pressure effect is produced which causes the air around the engine hot section to flow through the annular gap into the tailpipe. The rear section of the tailpipe is secured to the airframe by two support arms one on each side of the tailpipe. The support arms are attached to the upper surface of the wing in such a way that allow movement fore and aft to compensate for expansion. The tailpipe assembly is wrapped in an insulating blanket to shield the surrounding area from the high heat produced by the exhaust gases. Such blankets may be made of a stainless steel laminated sheet on the outside and fiberglass on the inside. This is used when the engine exhaust is located some distance from the edge of the wing or aircraft structure. Immediately after the turbine outlet, and usually just forward of the flange to which the exhaust duct is attached, the engine is instrumented for turbine discharge pressure. One or more pressure probes are inserted into the exhaust duct to provide adequate sampling of the exhaust gases. In large engines, it is not practical to measure the internal temperature at the turbine inlet, so the engine is often also instrumented for exhaust gas temperature at the turbine outlet. 3-27 Convergent Exhaust Nozzle As the exhaust gases exit the rear of the engine, they flow into the exhaust nozzle. Figure 3-46 The very first part of the exhaust nozzle and the exhaust plug form a divergent duct to reduce turbulence in the airflow. Then the exhaust gases flow into the convergent component of the exhaust nozzle, where the flow is restricted by a smaller outlet opening. Since this forms a convergent duct, the gas velocity is increased providing increased thrust. The restriction of the opening of the outlet of the exhaust nozzle is limited by two factors. If the nozzle opening is too big, thrust is being wasted. 
If it is too little, the flow is choked in the other components of the engine. In other words, the exhaust nozzle acts as an orifice, the size of which determines the density and velocity of the gases as they emerge from the engine. This is critical to thrust performance. Adjusting the area of the exhaust nozzle changes both the engine performance and the exhaust gas temperature. When the velocity of the exhaust gases at the nozzle opening becomes Mach 1, the flow passes only at this speed. It does not increase or decrease. Sufficient flow to maintain Mach 1 at the nozzle opening and have extra flow, flow that is being restricted by the opening, creates what is called a choke nozzle. The extra flow builds up pressure in the nozzle, which is sometimes called pressure thrust. A differential in pressure exists between the inside of the nozzle and the ambient air. By multiplying this difference in pressure times the area of the nozzle opening, pressure thrust can be calculated. Many engines cannot develop pressure thrust because most of the energy is used to drive turbines that turn propellers, large fans, or helicopter rotors. Tail cone exhaust nozzle. Figure 3 46. Exhaust gases exit the rear of the engine through the exhaust nozzle. Convergent divergent exhaust nozzle. Whenever the engine pressure ratio is high enough to produce exhaust gas velocities which might exceed Mach 1 at the engine exhaust nozzle, more thrust can be gained by using a convergent divergent type of nozzle. Figure 3 47. The advantage of a convergent divergent nozzle is greatest at high Mach numbers because of the resulting higher pressure ratio across the engine exhaust nozzle. Subsonic convergent section. Supersonic divergent section. Exhaust nozzle. Gas attains sonic velocity. Figure 3 47. A convergent divergent nozzle can be used to help produce more thrust when exhaust gas velocities are greater than Mach 1. To ensure that a constant weight or volume of a gas flows past any given point after sonic velocity is reached, the rear part of a supersonic exhaust duct is enlarged to accommodate the additional weight or volume of a gas that flows at supersonic rates. If this is not done, the nozzle does not operate efficiently. This is the divergent section of the exhaust duct. When a divergent duct is used in combination with a conventional exhaust duct, it is called a convergent divergent exhaust duct. In the convergent divergent, or CD nozzle, the convergent section is designed to handle the gases while they remain subsonic, and to deliver the gases to the throat of the nozzle just as they attain sonic velocity. The divergent section handles the gases, further increasing their velocity, after they emerge from the throat, and become supersonic. As the gas flows from the throat of the nozzle, it becomes supersonic, Mach 1 and above, and then passes into the divergent section of the nozzle. Since it is supersonic, it continues to increase in velocity. This type of nozzle is generally used on very high-speed aerospace vehicles. Thrust Reversers As aircraft have increased in gross weights with higher landing airspeeds, the problem of stopping an aircraft after landing has greatly increased. In many instances, the aircraft brakes can no longer be relied upon solely to slow the aircraft within a reasonable distance, immediately after touchdown. 3-28 Most thrust reverser systems can be divided into two categories, mechanical blockage and aerodynamic blockage. Mechanical blockage is accomplished by placing a removable obstruction in the exhaust gas stream, usually somewhat to the rear of the nozzle. The engine exhaust gases are mechanically blocked and diverted at a suitable angle in the reverse direction by an inverted cone, half sphere, or clam shell. Figure 3-48 this is placed in position to reverse the flow of exhaust gases. This type is generally used with ducted turbofan engines, where the fan and core flow mix in a common nozzle before exiting the engine. The clamshell type or mechanical blockage reverser operates to form a barrier in the path of escaping exhaust gases, which nullifies and reverses the forward thrust of the engine. The reverser system must be able to withstand high temperatures, be mechanically strong, relatively light in weight, reliable, and fail-safe. When not in use, it must be streamlined into the configuration of the engine nutshell. When the reverser is not in use, the clamshell doors retract and nest neatly around the engine exhaust duct, usually forming the rear section of the engine nutshell. Forward thrust. Reverse thrust. Figure 3-48. Engine exhaust gases are blocked and diverted in a reserve direction during thrust reversal. In the aerodynamic blockage type of thrust reverser, used mainly with unducted turbofan engines, only fan air is used to slow the aircraft. A modern aerodynamic thrust reverser system consists of a translating cowl, blocker doors, and cascade vanes that redirect the fan airflow to slow the aircraft. Figure 3-49 If the thrust levers are at idle position and the aircraft has weight on the wheels, moving the thrust levers aft activates the translating cowl to open closing the blocker doors. This action stops the fan airflow from going aft and redirects it through the cascade vanes, which direct the airflow forward to slow the aircraft. Since the fan can produce approximately 80% of the engine's thrust, the fan is the best source for reverse thrust. By returning the thrust levers, power levers, to the idle position, the blocker doors open, and the translating cowl closes. A thrust reverser must not have any adverse effect on engine operation either deployed or stowed. Generally, there is an indication in the flight deck with regard to the status of the reverser system. The thrust reverser system consists of several components that move either the clamshell doors or the blocker door and translating cowl. Actuating power is generally pneumatic or hydraulic and uses gearboxes, flex drives, screw jacks, control valves, and air or hydraulic motors to deploy or stow the thrust reverser systems. The systems are locked in the stowed position until commanded to deploy by the flight deck.
since there are several moving parts. Maintenance and inspection requirements are very important. While performing any type of maintenance, the reverser system must be mechanically locked out from deploying while personnel are in the area of the reverser system. Afterburning slash thrust augmentation. The terms afterburning and thrust augmentation generally pertain to military engine applications. The terms are used to describe the same system. Normally, this is used to increase the thrust of the engine up to double the original thrust. The required additions to the exhaust nozzle for this system are a flame stabilizer, fuel manifold, flame holder, igniter, and a variable area exhaust nozzle. Figure 3-50 After the engine has reached full power under normal operation, the power lever can be advanced to activate the afterburner. This allows more fuel to flow into the exhaust nozzle where it is ignited and burned. As energy and mass is added to the gas flow, the exhaust nozzle must open wider to allow greater flow. As the power lever is moved back out of the afterburner, the exhaust nozzle closes down again. Some low-bypass turbofan engines used in military aircraft use bypass, fan air, to flow into the exhaust nozzle. Just as in a ducted fan, this air is used in the afterburner. It contains more oxygen and assists combustion in the afterburner. Since fuel is being burned in the exhaust nozzle, the heat buildup around the nozzle is a 3-29. Translating cowl cascade vanes power lever. Blocker doors. Direction and speed control valve. Reverse thrust select lever, forward thrust, vent. Lock indicator light switch. Flexible drive. Flexible drive. Flexible drive. Gearbox. Screw jack. Air motor. Forward thrust position. Reverse thrust select lever, reverse thrust, lock and sequence valve. Selector valve. Fuel regulator. Feedback gearbox. Pressure regulator and soft. Air motor unit. Exhaust. Blocker doors. Folded. Reverse thrust position. Figure 3 49. Components of a thrust reverser system. 3 30. Figure 3 50. An example of a variable area exhaust nozzle used to increase or decrease exhaust flow during afterburn. Figure 3 51. A pilot can direct thrust via the vectoring nozzle 20 degrees. Problem. A special type of liner is used around the nozzle to up or down to increase flight maneuverability. Allow cooler air to circulate around the nozzle. This operates somewhat like a single burner can combustion chamber. Operation in the afterburner mode is somewhat limited by high fuel consumption, which can be almost double normal consumption. Thrust vectoring. Thrust vectoring is the ability of an aircraft's main engines to direct thrust other than parallel to the vehicle's longitudinal axis, allowing the exhaust nozzle to move or change position to direct the thrust in varied directions. Vertical takeoff aircraft use thrust vectoring as takeoff thrust and then change direction to propel the aircraft in horizontal flight. Military aircraft use thrust vectoring for maneuvering in flight to change direction. Thrust vectoring is generally accomplished by relocating the direction of the exhaust nozzle to direct the thrust to move the aircraft in the desired path. At the rear of a gas turbine engine, a nozzle directs the flow of hot exhaust gases out of the engine and afterburner. Usually, the nozzle points straight out of the engine. The pilot can move, or vector, the vectoring nozzle up and down by 20 degrees. This makes the aircraft much more maneuverable in flight. Figure 3-51, Engine Noise Suppression Aircraft powered by gas turbine engines sometimes require noise suppression for the engine exhaust gases when operating from airports located in or near highly populated areas. Several types of noise suppressor are used. A common type of noise suppressor is an integral, airborne part of the aircraft engine installation or engine exhaust nozzle. Engine noise comes from several sources on the engine, the fan, or compressor and the air discharge from the core of the engine. There are three sources of noise involved in the operation of a gas turbine engine. The engine air intake and vibration from engine housing are sources of some noise. But the noise generated does not compare in magnitude with that produced by the engine exhaust. Figure 3-52 The noise produced by the engine exhaust is caused by the high degree of turbulence of a high-velocity jet stream moving through a relatively quiet atmosphere. For a distance of a few nozzle diameters downstream behind the engine, the velocity of the jet stream is high, and there is little mixing of the atmosphere with the jet stream. In this region, the turbulence within the high-speed jet stream is very fine-grained turbulence, and produces relatively high-frequency noise. This noise is caused by violent, turbulent mixing of the exhaust gases with the atmosphere, and is influenced by the shearing action caused by the relative speeds between the velocity and the atmosphere. Farther downstream, as the velocity of the jet stream slows down, the jet stream mixes with the atmosphere and turbulence of a coarser type begins. Compared with noise from other portions of the jet stream, noise from this portion has a much lower frequency. As the energy of the jet stream finally is dissipated in large turbulent swirls, a greater portion of the energy is converted into noise. The noise generated as the exhaust gases dissipate is at a frequency near the low end of the audible range. The lower the frequency of the noise, the greater the distance the noise travels. This means that the low frequency noises reach an individual on the ground in greater volume than the high frequency noises, and hence are more objectionable. High frequency noise is weakened more rapidly than low frequency noise, both by distance and the interference of buildings, terrain, and atmospheric disturbances. A deep voiced, low frequency foghorn, for example, may be heard much farther than a shrill, high frequency whistle.
even though both may have the same overall volume, decibels, at their source, 3-31, 30 D-10 D, D, 10 degrees, most of the noise radiates from this low-frequency turbulence region, D equals nozzle diameter, figure 3-52. Engine noise from engine exhaust is created by the turbulence of a high-velocity jet stream moving through the relatively quiet atmosphere. Noise levels vary with engine thrust and are proportional to the amount of work done by the engine on the air that passes through it. An engine having relatively low airflow but high thrust due to high turbine discharge, exhaust gas, temperature, pressure, and or afterburning produces a gas stream of high velocity and, therefore, high noise levels. A larger engine, handling more air, is quieter at the same thrust. Thus, the noise level can be reduced considerably by operating the engine at lower power settings and large engines operating at partial thrust are less noisy than smaller engines operating at full thrust. Compared with a turbojet, a turbofan version of the same engine is quieter during takeoff. The noise level produced by a fan-type engine is less, principally because the exhaust gas velocities ejected at the engine tailpipe are slower than those for a turbojet of comparative size. Fan engines require a larger turbine to provide additional power to drive the fan. The large turbine, which usually has an additional turbine stage, reduces the velocity of the gas and, therefore, Reduces the noise produced because exhaust gas noise is proportional to exhaust gas velocity. The exhaust from the fan is at a relatively low velocity and, therefore, does not create a noise problem. Because of the characteristic of low frequency noise to linger at a relatively high volume, effective noise reduction for a turbojet aircraft must be achieved by revising the noise pattern, or by changing the frequency of the noise emitted by the jet nozzle. The noise suppressors in current use are either of the corrugated perimeter type, or the multi-tube type. Figure 3-53, both types of suppressors break up the single main jet exhaust stream into a number of smaller jet streams. This increases tail cone. Figure 3-53. Noise suppressors currently in use are corrugated perimeter type, or multi-tube type. The total perimeter of the nozzle area, and reduces the size of the air stream that is created as the gases are discharged into the open air. Although the total noise energy remains unchanged, the frequency is raised considerably. The size of the air stream that is scales down at a linear rate with the size of the exhaust stream. This has two effects. 1. The change in frequency may put some of the noise above the audibility range of the human ear, and two, high frequencies within the audible range, while perhaps more annoying, are more highly attenuated by atmospheric absorption than are low frequencies. Thus, the fall-off in intensity is greater, and the noise level is less at any given distance from the aircraft. In the engine nutshell, the area between the engine and the cowl has acoustic linings surrounding the engine. This absorbing lining material converts acoustic energy into heat. These linings normally consist of a porous skin supported by a honeycomb backing, and provide a separation between. 3-32 The fact sheet and the engine duct For optimum suppression, the acoustic properties of the skin and the liner are carefully matched. Turbine engine emissions Engineers are introducing new combustion technology that has dramatically reduced emissions from gas turbine engines. Lowering exhaust emissions from gas turbine, especially oxides of nitrogen, NOx, continue to require improvement. Most of the research has centered around the combustion section of the engine. New technology with unique combustor design has greatly reduced emissions. One manufacturer has a design called the Twin Annular, Pre-Mixing Swirler, Taps, Combustor. Most advanced designs rely on a method of pre-mixing the fuel-slash-air before it enters the combustion burner area. In the Taps design, air from the high-pressure compressor is directed into the combustor through two high-energy swirlers adjacent to the fuel nozzles. This swirl creates a more thorough and leaner mix of fuel and air, which burns at lower temperatures than in previous gas turbine engine designs. Most of the NOx is formed by the reaction of oxygen and nitrogen at high temperatures. The NOx levels are higher if the burning fuel-slash-air mixture stays at high temperatures for a longer time. Newly designed combustors also produce lower levels of carbon monoxide and unburned hydrocarbons. The increases in gas turbine engine component efficiencies have resulted in fewer emissions from gas turbine engines. 3-33 3-34 Chapter 4 Engine Ignition and Electrical Systems